the third lecture is really not a lecture. It's, it's I kind of just threw some slides together so that we can have some fun trying to program. Uh, <clears throat> but you won't, it's very difficult to communicate what's going on without actually doing in this context. So it's really kind of important that you do actually engage and do actually try some of the, the exercises, even if they seem, <clears throat> seem trivial. The first ones were meant to be who completed the first set. Ooh, that's really, that's, the, what, what, that's, that's a terrible percentage. Okay, less drinking, more doing. There's, it's actually really cool. And I, I, I beg you to be engaged. There's interesting stuff here. Um, and I think as much as I stand up here and talk at you, Yura, Yura said, uh, uh, I think somewhat correctly, that the introduction was, you know, it, uh, the, stru the structure of the talk might have been better last time if I'd done exciting, boring, than exciting, rather than boring, 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 exciting at the very end. Um, <clears throat> fair enough. Uh, but I think that this is one of these, these this, this discipline, this area is one of these areas where you, you got you to gotta get into it and start thinking in the style of the area to understand what's going on, because it's a little deeper than, than, it, than it might uh, at first appear. Anyway, so I, I left off a couple of slides last time, so when people are walking in, I'll just talk over those slides quickly. We'll look at the, the, the exercises and their solutions uh, for the first set of exercises, and then I'll get into the, the second lecture. So I wanted to, to, to stress that what I'm talking about, if you spend the time doing the exercises here, what you learn will be applicable to uh, the broad range of Turing complete probabilistic programming languages as they exist today. It's not, I'm not giving you a lesson in Anglican. I'm not trying to promote Anglican per se, but instead trying to show you how to think in this kind of new way and try to convince you that there's something actually interesting going on here. Um, so one of the things that I wanted to do is, is to point out the difference between sort of church syntax, uh, venture syntax, and Anglican syntax and show you that they're basically the same. Comparing Anglican church venture, uh, we want, want to make sure that you understand that I'm not brainwashing you in terms of a particular language. So let's, let's, put, let's put, so last time we did a bunch of examples, one of which was Gaussian with unknown mean. Uh, I'll put venture and church up side by side and point out that this is basically the, 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 the Anglican syntax down here, where if we do, an, this is just Gaussian with unknown mean. Uh, so here we assume that there's some unknown mean that's normally distributed. We assume that there's some function that generates random variables distributed according to a normal distribution with that unknown mean. Here we have an anonymous function standing in between, no particular reason. Uh, then uh, <coughs> we observe the output of this evaluation taking value 5. In other words, we observe a draw from this normal distribution taking value 5. We observe another draw from the same, same normal distribution uh, with value 6. Then we predict mu. Now, venture differs slightly in its in its calling semantics from uh, from Anglican uh, syntactically and semantically in one massive way, which is there's a, there are infer directives in uh, uh, in venture, which allow you to specify particular kernels for doing inference, and in fact, binding subsets of variables or naming subsets of variables to perform different kinds of inference on. Uh, and if, I, if I'm correct here, I believe that infer progresses the state of the, the, the execution machine one step in terms of a, of a, of, of a, of a, uh, of a sampling step. Fair? Yeah. So basically, when you write an Anglican program, it just begins generating samples. Uh, in venture, you actually tell the machine explicitly how many inference steps to perform uh, by interleaving infer steps as, and as, as often as you would like. Uh, and you might specify in an infer instruction exactly what kernel to run and for how long, so on and so forth. Okay, so I said I talked about venture being sort of also a, it, it interfaced. One interface to, to venture is the same kind of interface as Anglican. You write some code uh, and you run it. You see what its output is. It's interactive in the sense that there is a ripple that you can download, and, and which is the read infer predict layer, which is like a scheme read evaluate print loop. Uh, except that it has stochastic instructions, blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you can type these in and see exactly how the program is, is, uh, is evolving over time. It also has this sort of Python outer language within a language interface where you can instantiate this uh, essentially a library uh, and then 
call functions on that, which correspond to the, the same set of statements here, essentially. So v.assume says get mu normal, and you can sort of see what happens. So there's the language within a language, and then you can draw some posterior samples, which basically does this infer, 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 interleaving, and then, uh, then because you're in Python, you can actually manipulate the samples that come out and plot them directly and so on and so forth, which is kind of nice. So if you're a Python, Python person, this is, this is maybe one way to go um, instead of my old school Unix hackery where obviously you do a lot of shell scripting and random plotting. Okay, so the, the, the church syntax is almost the same, but there's a different, there's a different uh, way of invoking inference in church. So here we have some observed data. The observations show up in these observed statements in Venture. Here we have some observed data. It's a different data set. That's fine. The number of observations is the length of that. Then what we, what we do is, is, um, is church has, a, has a, a, a function called query or MH query or something like that that takes an internal procedure so basically, it takes a model, which are these defines. So you define the mean, the variance, and the sample, the, the procedure from sampling from a Gaussian. You specify what you'd like to predict. That's this, this query expression. And then you specify a set of constraints. So here we ask whether or not, with equality, the observed data actually matches exactly the draws that came from these, these, uh, these Gaussians. Okay? So when you run this, this will run MH query. Uh, it will run Metropolis Hastings over this little program and generate a set of samples. So now, kind of, it's a scheme within scheme thing where this set of samples, then you can manipulate and do whatever you want. Now, what's kind of nice here is that you can write query over query, and there's crazy things that happen with that. And I recommend that you look at Forrest DB and and Andreas Stummuller's uh, website to think about the kind of things that you can do if you do inference about inference about inference, and there's recursive inference about inference. This, this kind of thing, as I hopefully will be able to convince you today, can be written in this language as well. So there's no, there's no difference in expressivity. Um, but uh, natively, you perform queries in church, and natively, you write programs in, 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 in Venture and Anglican. So this is basically exactly Anglican, with the, the, the exception that we, you don't have to uh, to stick these infer statements in, uh, and uh, we and Anglican doesn't give you the ability to mix Metropolis kernels or mix uh, inference procedures, uh, and of course Anglican does not have Python bindings, but it does uh, have a, a coherent streaming interface in the kind of Unix way. Okay, so. Uh, if you've started playing with things, um, the realistic limitations, and I, and, I, and I hate to say this, is that really we're still at the point where you can really actually, in probabilistic programming systems, deal with small models. Okay? That doesn't mean not expressive models. It doesn't mean whatever. But we're not at Google slash Facebook slash whatever scale. Um, uh, there's a DARPA program, which is sponsoring Venture in particular, and my own lab, uh, that will... Uh, <coughs> hopefully change all of this. We have some interesting avenues to scalability. Venture has this sort of very nice inference programming uh, idea. It, uh, uh, it, has, it, it, use, it does efficient computation in terms of reusing program traces. Probabilistic C is compiled PMCMC. Uh, Probabilistic JS is a transformational compilation approach to, to doing uh, inference in, in, in church. Uh, these have, are basically the next step in scalability towards actual, actual practi practical ability in, in really big domains. And by small model, I should stress here that by small model, uh, it does encapsulate most, uh, m most NIPS publication size problems now. <laughs> so you could use this for model uh, you know, for the development of new kinds of models or Bayesian nonparametric models or something like that and actually perform inference on the kinds of sizes of data that you see in most NIPs or, or AI stats or ICML publications. Of course, also, when you start playing with systems, as unfortunately few of you have done, but fortunately in the sense that um, 
with uh, there's relatively little little documentation. The implementations are still there. You'll, you'll find bugs. That's always problematic when you're working in a programming language. So you wouldn't want to deploy a system based on these quite yet. Uh, and of course, there are some limitations. There are some philosophical limitations. So not all machine learning models and techniques are naturally generative. So if you work on Markov random fields or your your model is a specific kind of factor graph that that's what you want to do inference in. It's not necessarily obvious that you should that, that that specific problem is going to map exactly into the kind of systems we're developing. Uh, and there's a limitation in Anglican, which I which I which I pointed out. Although there's a little bit of an in and out burger thing going on here, uh, Anglican forces the outermost observed to be an ERP, and that can be programmatically cumbersome. We'll get to that in a little bit. Last thing from last time uh, is. Uh, I just wanted to talk about workflow a little bit. So uh, several people that have worked with me on learning how to do probabilistic programming get very, very confused about, even though uh, you know, I spend a lot of boring time talking about, about writing a generative model and a program as a, as a sampling procedure and a program as a generative model, what they end up trying to do is actually shoehorn the traditional approach into the probabilistic programming approach. So the traditional approach to doing machine learning is to do the following process, basically. You define some sort of model, then you sit down and you do a bunch of math, um, you derive a bunch of inference updates, and then you do some sort of inference. You do Markov chain Monte Carlo. If you're doing that, you have to you know, derive a bunch of conditionals. If you're doing variational inference, you need some sort of fixed point updates, so on and so forth. Then you code the inference algorithm, right? Okay. And then you test that, and you find a bunch of bugs, and then you use it, and then you find either that you have bugs in the model or you have, or that inference doesn't work, and then you repeat the whole process over again. Okay? That is not what you do in probabilistic programming. Okay? So in probabilistic programming, you code the generative model. Right? Then you use it, and then you find either bugs in the model or that inference doesn't work. Now, if inference doesn't work, you start doing research in probabilistic programming because you need inference algorithms to actually work on your, on your model and you try to build new interpreters and new inference engines that, that, that work. Um, but most of the time, you know, for small problems, again, uh, if, if, in, if, if inference does work for you and your problem is adequately scaled and your model's okay, then you're done. There's no, this part right here, this code inference algorithm is, is not there, okay? So as we go further today, uh, just keep that in mind when, when you start trying to write programs you're doing this. You're not doing this. OK, so that's what I wanted to say from last time. Uh, so now, now how many people have actually tried the exercises? Any change? People are got, have got their laptops out. Oh my god, still terrible. OK. You know, I did mention, just to throw, that out, throw this out there, that I spent more time preparing the exercises than I did the talks. So the, the real value here is, is, uh, is in, the, in the exercises, not in the talks. So if you don't do the exercises, then, uh, well, you, you, yeah, you're bad. OK. Uh, so the exercises, for those of you who have done them, we'll take a look at them. And I'll give you a little in and out burger thing here as well. So the exercises, there were a couple people who had difficulty finding them last time. They're, they're, they're here, Anglican teaching. They're linked off of my, 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 my web page. They are not linked off of the main thing because I wanted to keep it special for you guys. So that's an in and out burger thing. MLS, MLSS 2014, learning probabilistic programming. OK, the exercises, the, the first two that I had you do were automatic inferences programming, which, did a, which is a little beta binomial uh, example. OK, it's pretty easy. There's a pencil factory. You observe some defects, and you want to decide whether or not to buy the factory, depending on whether, what the pr actual probability of there being uh, uh, of the factory producing defective pencils. So we had you write, look at a little program like this. Uh, uh, assume P is uniform continuous, 0, 1. Observe flip, false. Predict P. And what we wanted to do is uh, 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 verify that this actually draws from the, uh, the correct distribution. That's pretty straightforward. You just run the program. And again, just to, just to, to do this, uh, that's not the right uh, <coughs> string. Uh, I won't do that because I want to get to the lecture. Anyway, so it does the right thing. Um, we, 
the, the next thing is uh, to, to change the individual draws of, of, of flip here. Uh, let me go back. Here. These, uh, these observations of true or false to be uh, a binomial draw. Um, and then we ask you to change the prior. Now, this one I'm not, you're not going to spend a lot, of, a lot of time on because it's really easy, but here's another in and out burger thing. Um, <clears throat> if you change questions to answers, the answers are provided. Okay? So you can go in and you can and look and see exactly what's going on, how to replace, uh, uh, how to replace, uh, so how to write the next program where you uh, observe a binomial quantity. So in other words, seven failures or or, or uh, in in ten draws from this 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 uh, uh, model with uh, a beta prior on the success success probability. Um, and here's a kind of a, uh, an answer to the, the last question, which is how would you write sort of a, a crazy generative model for the success probability that we would have a very difficult time doing analytic integration or uh, uh, inverting the model analytically. Yeah? I have a question. Yeah, yeah great. I noticed in, in this um, last part of the first uh -huh. exercise, it says that it's a cutoff. Uh, so basically cut off exponential, but actually what it does, it just puts all the probability mass on the one, so. So you're saying what the, what the. Or the rest of, I mean, the, the rest of the probability <coughs> mass that is behind one and exponential, it just puts it at one. Because it's always one. If, That's correct. Um, but then kind of give the strange behavior, I guess. Okay, so so the, the the question is basically is is a, you're asking a modeling question, right? Okay, so let's let, so the, the question is basically let's look at this program. What is it what is it doing? Okay, so we have some success probability p, and we want to put some sort of prior on it. And naturally, all of us as Bayesian this is a great question. Na naturally, all of us as Bayesian statisticians would say, well, what's the natural thing that you would do? Uh, you'd put a, a a beta prior on that success probability, and then generate from that and then generate your data and then do a model inversion. Well, um, this is just an example. The only reason to put this up here is to, is to give you an example of the fact that you can be extremely flexible ab about, about specifying this prior. Okay? So you're, the, the point was raised that this is kind of a crazy prior on the success probability. So z is exponential 0.5. So we've got some sort of heavy tail thing off to the right. But then p is defined to be if z is greater than 1, it's 1, otherwise it's z. Okay, that's fine. It's a prior. It encodes some, some idea about what, what you think the, the, failure, the true failure rate would be. You can look at what that distribution looks like. Maybe it's appropriate, maybe it's not. Uh, you, you can't analytically invert this, 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 this model, but in a probabilistic programming context, it's absolutely no problem. So that kind of flexibility it, it can either be a good thing, uh, I think of it as basically always being a good thing because you can actually specify your real true prior beliefs without actually, without sort of shoehorning your belief into some sort of existing distribution or something that may or may not correspond to uh, um, actually what's happening in the, in the generative process. Does that make sense? Is anybody paying attention? Everybody's looking, looking at Facebook now. Uh, the next, the next question, the next set of questions was uh, uh, something about uh, the arithmetic expressions example. Who completed this one? Oh my dear God! Okay, let me stress again: if you don't do these exercises, then you're 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 missing almost the entire point of of what I've uh, what I provided for you. Okay. So in the next break, you can start on this one. It's pretty easy. It actually gives you the code for the arithmetic expressions inference procedure. Uh, if we ask you to change the generative model to produce longer expressions, then we, try to, then we ask you to learn a, a more complex relationship, say, for instance, for a cubic function. And we ask you to in, induce unary operators, uh, like sine and cosine, into the generative model and try to learn a trigonometric functional expression, expression again. So just to give you a little bit of a hint, so again, the in and out burger thing is, is applies here. Excuse me. Uh, if you change that to answers, 
you get the answers. Uh, so, so if we look at if we look at this code for producing, let's go to the website actually because the code is on the website as well, and we'll ask ask you how to solve the first question, and then we'll go on to the lecture. Okay. Uh, Okay, so the first question in the in in this in this exercise is change the model to produce longer expressions. Okay, so let's look at this code again really quickly. Uh, so, how would one change the productions rule this this uh, this PCFG to generate longer to to place prior mass on longer expressions? Okay, so what would that be? So the, the, the suggestion was you could introduce higher mass, you could give higher mass to the generating part of the code rather than the one that generates constants. So where's that? <laughs> okay, does everybody see why if you increase the, that number, you're actually asking for the, 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 the inference engine to produce longer expressions? Who sees it? Who doesn't see it? Okay, all right. So let's read this code just again really quickly so you get a sense of what's going on. Um, so this is a PCFG, right? So this is a procedure that defines a, an expression type, which is a, a, draw from, a discrete draw from a list. The, the list probabilities are 0 0.4, 0 0.3, 0 0.3, okay? Uh, so when you draw from this, you're gonna either get zero, one, or two with those probabilities, okay? Then we condition on the expression type. If the expression type is zero, then what this code does is it draws an, a, an int integer constant by running a procedure defined up here, which actually the next the line just above this does that, uh, which draws a uniform discrete number between 0 and 10. Uh, if the expression type is 1, it returns the expression x, the value, uh, the, the, the symbol x, excuse me. Um, otherwise, it creates a list i.e. basically parentheses in, in Lisp, right? Where it takes the nth element of a list consisting of the symbol plus, the symbol minus, the symbol times, or the symbol safe div, where safe div is defined here, okay? Uh, picked by drawing uniformly from a discrete distribution over point, uh, with equal probability over each of those expression types. So it chooses an expression and then recursively calls productions. Okay? So the recursive call to productions enters again here, defines an expression type, which could be either an int integer constant or a, the symbol x or yet another operation with another recursive call to productions. But when this exits, it will have generated a large number of, it will have generated an, an, an expression tree, right? So, it will do something like this. The first thing it will do is it will pick what, what goes here, plus, for instance. Then it recurs and says it's going to build something here as well, right? And it could be uh, minus, okay? Then it recurs again, uh, x and 7. And here it could be just a constant, uh, 8. <coughs> no, technically it's not, not parentheses here. Okay. And what this, this builds is, is a, an expression okay, that then gets evaluated. And that's this expression. This is a prior on these expressions. Right? We're doing inference over the expressions themselves. Right? So again, now, now that I've done that, how do you increase how do you place prior mass on longer expressions? You've already answered the question correctly, but for those of you who didn't get what was going on, so how do you do it? Somebody else? Increase the probability of recurring. Increase the probability of recurring, which is that probability. OK? 
Okay, so relative to the others, if you increase that probability, you put prior mass on longer expressions. Okay, all right. And going on, and so how would you introduce unary operations? You would just have a, a new conditional. That's right. So adding unary operations says you just add a new conditional, so you can put an expression type here, which would be a unary operation, which takes one argument, returns some sort of symbol. Okay. How do you do trigonometric functions? You introduce, how do you do inference over trigonometric expressions? You introduce unary, unary uh, uh, operators, and instead of having two productions here, you have a single, per, single recursive call to productions. Make sense? Okay, all right. So it, it's fun to play with this. It's actually kind of cool that it, that it works, all right. 